You're listening to the Visionary Lifestyle Podcast, the show that's dedicated to raising consciousness and empowering you to activate your highest potential. I'm your host, Magda Freedom Rod. Our guest today is Dr. Bruce Lipton. Dr. Lipton is an internationally recognized leader in bridging the gap between science and spirituality. He's a stem cell biologist, a best-selling author, and he's really a pioneer in biology and epigenetics. He's been a guest speaker on hundreds of TV and radio shows, as well as a keynote presenter for national and international conferences. He's the author of the bestseller, The Biology of Belief, Unleashing the Power of Consciousness, Matter, and Miracles, as well as The Honeymoon Effect, The Science of Creating Heaven on Earth, and co-author of Spontaneous Evolution, Our Positive Future, and A Way to Get There from Here. Bruce teaches that belief is an energy field and that there are invisible forces influencing our lives, with 70% of them being negative and self-sabotaging. In this interview, he breaks down how 95% of our lives are dictated by our subconscious programming, and towards the end of the show, he helps us understand the ways to reprogram ourselves. We recorded this interview in his room at the Parmarth Nikitan Ashram, right next to the Ganga River during the International Yoga Festival in Rishikesh, India. You'll hear some background noise of the streets, so I hope you can appreciate that we're bringing India to you. Our conversation was super long and deep, so much so that I had to break it into two segments. In the first segment, we talk a lot about the state of the world, the fact that we're in the sixth mass extinction on the planet. We talk about climate change, human behavior, food choices, and then we start getting into the science of epigenetics. In the second segment, we get deeper into the biology of belief, how we're run by our subconscious, how yoga can be a solution, and how we can become the masters of our own lives. It's a really deep discussion about how we go wrong with our thoughts, and then we tap into the solutions to reprogram the subconscious. There's a great nugget at the end that I really want everyone to do as homework. This episode can be really life-changing for you, so I hope you listen to the whole thing and give it your full attention. Bruce is a real sweetheart and a brilliant man and biologist, and I'm really grateful that I got this time with him and that you all are going to get to benefit from this conversation that we had. It's really full of important information for you to take control of your own life and create the life that you truly desire. Enjoy and namaste. Bruce Lipton, welcome to the show. I am so delighted to be here with you. We have such wonderful things to talk about, and and I think uh, uh, for our audience of cultural creatives, those people that are making a difference, I think we have some really great information about uh, the future of civilization, which kind of looks bleak at the moment, but to me that's actually the good news, and it's like, good news? Yeah. We'll talk about that. Right, exactly, exactly. Let, let's discuss that. I did overhear you talking to someone yesterday, which prompted me to, I already wanted to interview you, but when I heard you making that point with someone, I said, we got to get this interview in while I'm here because this is a very timely issue with the recent elections in the United States. A lot of people are kind of in panic and fear mode, right? Yes. So I think you and I share the same perspective about what's going on. So let, let's hear it from you and your perspective. What's going on right now? Well, the biggest issue, which is an issue that nobody really talks about because psychologically uh, it's very difficult for humans to deal with a problem that's so big that you can't have any immediate response to it. And a problem that says we have to do something now that will change something later because we always tend to do, what do I need to do right now for right now? And I say, no, we have to do this now for something that's coming down the road real fast. And so what is that something? Uh, and the issue, what, is, what are we skirting and not talking about? And that is, this planet uh, has had life thriving in the past, and, and, and then something happened, and, and then life went through a massive extinction. So we call these mass extinction events. And so five times in the history of this planet, life was absolutely thriving. Everything was going great guns. And then something happened. And somewhere between 50 to 90% of all life got wiped out in each of these previous mass extinctions. 
Science uh, has attributed uh, mass extinctions to something like asteroids or comets hitting the planet and upending the environment and wiping out life, and that's true, that has happened in the past. Uh, and also like um, periods of massive geological activity where uh, earthquakes and volcanoes, like all of a sudden all over the globe at one time, the crust is shaking uh, and, and life again got wiped out. So basically it says five times uh, we've been through mass extinctions. Interesting point today is that we are in, and I say in, the sixth mass extinction of life. Mm -hmm. I say we're in it for, first of all, the main reason is this, the loss of, of uh, the biosphere in the last few years has been unprecedented except for the previous mass extinctions. So just to give a, you know, a beginning point right here is that um, if you were here in 1970, this, uh, the last time they, they did a major uh, population study of animals on this planet. How many animals are on this planet? All mm -hmm. different kinds of animals. So it was like a massive survey. And they recently uh, took another look at that. So they found that 62% of the animal life on this planet that uh, has been lost since 1970. 62%. We're down to 30, 38% of the animals that were here in 1970 are left now. So two thirds essentially of life has disappeared since 1970. And this, this loss is the, the kind of loss that represents uh, a mass extinction event. Just a, another insight, uh, there's always species getting lost, that's just normal life. Mm -hmm. But we call that, like, we'll call that the natural loss, it's just we call it background. And today, the loss of uh, species is 1,000 times greater than background. So it's like, okay, let, let's pay attention here, folks. Yeah, the world is slipping away here, you know, uh, and, and another statistic that you have to stop and go, oh my God, uh, a conservative estimate is by 2048, there will be no fish left in the ocean. Right. And that's like almost science fiction. It's like planet Earth with no fish. I mean, uh, my, 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 my children, my grandchildren to, to say, listen, go, go look at the fish, hurry up, they're right. not going to be here in your lifetime. Right. It's like, oh my God. Okay, so what are we doing about it? Well, what do you, what do you attribute that to, first of all? It's well, oh yes, that's a, thank you for that. Right? Thank I you mean, for that, because that is the issue. And science has looked at how come we're, we're in such a critical stage. Uh, and, and, and I'm so glad you asked, because the answer is human behavior is undermining the ecosystem. Uh, all the ways we're uh, um, upending the environment uh, uh, with the way we're destroying the forest uh, and people don't recognize, yeah, forests are nice, they have beautiful trees and all that. And it's like, no, you, if you look at the earth as a living system, the forests are the lungs. The forests are cleaning the air and, and, and putting oxygen into our atmosphere and, and helping us stay alive. Uh, and then we wipe out these forests to plant stuff to you know have mcdonald's give Soy us a super size to, meal and right, stuff to like feed that the it's animals and then to graze the animals they graze yeah. the animals and then the methane from the animals is even greater pollution than, than anything else and uh so basically it says the way we're consuming uh the the productivity of the earth in, in regard to agriculture and the way we're uh, consuming the natural resources of the earth uh, science has already recognized that to sustain our way of life we need two planet earths well Okay, that's right. a nice science fiction story. We have one planet and it's ailing right now. Right. So why is it relevant? Well, when we're talking about this looming extinction, I'm not just talking about the animals. Human civilization uh, requires the rest of nature for us to be here. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, if you look at the way we perceive of our history, especially in Judeo-Christian beliefs, they say, oh, Genesis, the earth was created, then all the plants and animals were created, and then later humans were added on top of it. A vision, if you take that in, that says, oh, uh, we're not really connected to nature, that we can use nature, but we're, we're a separate entity from nature. Well, this is such a, a problem of a, a belief problem, is that we are nature. We evolve from nature. We cannot live without nature. And so what we're doing is undermining the foundation of human civilization. Mm -hmm. 
and, and it's like, oh my God, uh, you know, we're destroying the earth. Well, we're not destroying the earth, we're destroying our own existence. Right. The earth will be here and be very happy when we're gone because it'll restore itself. As soon as we're gone, it'll restore itself to the garden that it was when we first got here. Right. So uh, I almost look at it as like uh, the humans are a virus in nature. And uh, when you have a virus, one of the ways you get rid of virus is you have a fever. Right. Uh, and so this global warming, in a sense, is like the Earth is having a fever because we are a virus infecting the planet and destroying it. I've never heard it put that way. It's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. I, I, I make the analogy of fleas. Like she shakes, she can just shake us off like a bunch of fleas. Like we're just bothering her. But the fever is even better. <laughs> well, the fever is yeah because it alters our ability to sustain ourselves and survive. And yeah. Uh, and it's very really interesting because you might uh, look at our our history of what we perceive as our history of our humans on this planet. And the conventional story that most of us learned in school is, uh, oh, civilization started around 5,000 BC uh, in Babylonia, the Tigris, Euphrates, River Valley, and this is the birthplace of civilization. Well, no. <laughs> mm -hmm. In fact, there have been civilizations that have been here before that were massive civilizations. In fact, um, uh, there's an um, uh, archaeological project in Turkey called Gobleki Tepe, and it was a city, and this is amazing, it was a city that was manually covered up with dirt and rocks and hidden under uh, like a mountain, uh, not a mountain, but a big a hill. You wouldn't even know there was a city there. Uh, what's interesting, it wasn't erosion and, and, and natural processes that led to the loss of the city. The people who lived in these cities actually took dirt and rocks and everything and filled up the buildings, the streets, and covered the entire city. They didn't even know it was there. It was, under, it was just like a mound, a big mountain, uh, not mountain, but a, a hill. And I say, well, why is it relevant? And they say, well, once they started digging it up, they say, oh my God, this was a massive advanced civilization under here. And then the interesting part, the uh, carbon dating mm -hmm. says that this civilization ended over 10,000 years ago. So there was a massive Whoa. civilization, it ended, and then it's like, now we dig it up, it's like, who are these people? Where are they? What happened? I mean, we have no idea of what happened. So uh, it, it was like, imagine, like today, we have this massive civilization, and 10,000 years, somebody comes back, they had no record that we were here. <laughs> Whoa. So what was the story? Well. We still don't know who that civilization was, or what, but, uh, but we do know they were advanced. They were not Stone Age people with stone axes. They were creating giant structures. Yeah. Uh, and, but let me connect it to the next important aspect of that, and that is in dating it, the carbon dating. Mm -hmm. It said that the loss of this civilization is uh, correlated with uh, a previous period of climate change. Oh. So that climate change and the loss of the civilization uh, were like um, right at the same time interval. And what's also interesting is this is in Turkey, and if you see the terrain in Turkey where this is, mm -hmm. it, it's really a kind of barren, deserty like uh, environment, not sustaining like massive growth for crops or anything. Mm -hmm. But apparently, before that climate change, when that civilization was there, it, 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 they were, it was a lush place to grow uh, food and everything. And then climate change, it ends up being now a desert. Right. Well, the fact is this, if you were in that civilization and it turned into a desert, then where the heck are you gonna get your food? Right. And so mm -hmm. climate change forced them to leave. Mm -hmm. and, and I say, well, well, that's pretty interesting, why? Because we are facing the exact same climate change exactly. right now. Yeah. And the question is, well, will we be uh, you know, under some dirt pile in 10,000 years, or right. will we be still here? Well, the issue is, what do we do now? And it's not right. what we'll do in 100 years. It's not even what we'll do in 10 years. It's what we do now. Right, today, yesterday. It, it, yeah, because it's already, the writing's on the wall. The, ex, the experience is already happening, uh, a, a simple fact. 52% uh, of the food in the United States comes from California. Mm -hmm. And California, up until this winter, had been in a drought for a number of years. And yep. I said, what was the relevance? Well, you couldn't grow anything. In fact, that we, you know, it used to be, everyone thinks Wisconsin's a dairy state. California had much more dairy, mm -hmm. but the reality was, guess they had to eliminate the, the herds of cattle mm -hmm. because there was no food or water. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, 
That's why food prices in the United States for things like fresh vegetables, which mainly come from California, mm -hmm. are, are rising. Why? Because the, the productivity can't match the demand. Right. Why? Climate change. Mm -hmm. And the question is, well, you're just seeing the beginning of climate change. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the writing's on the wall. It says, you can't sustain this this way. And, and did humans create climate change? Let's get this out of the way because um, there's so much controversy about that. Mm -hmm. uh, my perception and, and, and the way scientists have seen it is no. Climate change like 10,000 years ago was a cyclic period. What's different about today's version of climate change is what would have taken a longer period of change is now accelerated. And it's accelerated because of the way human behavior is altering the ecosystems and the way we're polluting the atmosphere and the burning of fossil fuels. All of these kinds of things are contributing to an acceleration. So humans are not making climate change, but humans are accelerating it to such a high degree mm -hmm. that the speed of that climate change may exceed our ability to uh, uh, change the way we live and you know, in time, accommodate to save ourselves. and adapt right. ourselves. Mm -hmm. So that's what the, the nature is like. Well, we got to do something right now because, uh, as I said, the overfishing uh, in the mm -hmm. sea and the destruction of the breeding grounds and the pollution of the water that we are doing mm -hmm. uh, is resulting in that extinction. Right. It says, well, if we don't stop this right away, that extinction will be here faster than 2048. Mm -hmm. So it says, we got to call on everybody to wake up. It's a wake up call. Yeah. I say, well, what's the wake up call? I say, the world is undergoing a global crisis right now, uh, precipitated in a large part by the recent election of Trump in the United States. Uh, and people look at this in fear and go, oh my God, you know, what's happening in the United States and all that is starting, you know, it's like it's falling apart in front of our and face. And the EPA gets wiped off the website on yeah. day one. Day one. Yes. And EPA <laughs> is, is the, the watchdog that was trying to help us prevent this loss of life on this planet. Right. And uh, the current administration has taken the money out of EPA and wants to make nuclear warheads. It's like, huh? <laughs> it's like mind boggling. Right. So I'm, and probably almost anybody who is thinking, mm -hmm. is going, oh my God, we're, the system is falling apart. And this is where I say good news, bad news. Right. The bad news, civilization as we know it is, is falling apart. In fact, NASA, has made a major scientific study and said within the next couple of decades there will be an irreversible collapse of industrial civilization. So you can look and go, oh, oh my God, I'm and I'm going, no, the bad news is the good news in this regard. Mm -hmm. The way we are living on uh, this planet right now is causing our extinction. Right. And the only way we will be able to survive is to build a civilization on a foundation other than the one we have. Industrial, other than industrial. The, the, and right? that, so it says the collapse of civilization is actually the benefit of civilization because if we build a more sustainable civilization, mm -hmm. we cannot build it on the foundation of the existing civilization. The existing civilization is causing the problem. Right. So if you want to change this, you can't put Band-Aids on what we have. You mm -hmm. actually have to raise it. You have to just bring it down. Yeah, and land then, and foundation. And that's it, yeah. because the foundation is rotten. Right. You can't build something beautiful on top of a crumbly foundation. And right. So when you look at it and you see it falling apart, you can go, oh my God, I'm afraid it's falling apart. And I'm going, I would be more afraid if it doesn't fall apart. Mm -hmm. So I look at it as like, great, this is the wake up call. Uh, it, it, it's sort of like, you could call it a symptom. A symptom is always what looks bad. The, uh, cancer is not a problem. Cancer is a symptom of a problem. It's an expression that the, that, that person that has that cancer is not in harmony with the world around them. Right, there's uh, an imbalance. Right, so we yeah. say, oh, well, the cancer is the problem. I go, no, the cancer is the consequence of a problem. Mm -hmm. And I say the, the, the falling down, the symptoms of our collapse is not the problem, it is the consequence of a problem that says not sustainable. Mm -hmm. So uh, welcome the civilization collapse, uh, because if it doesn't, the only thing you can welcome then is extinction. Right. Well, thank you so much for all of that. I'm in full agreement with you. How much do you think that uh, food choice plays into this collapse? <laughs> 
Well, food choice is, is one of the major contributors to the ecological disaster we're facing. I said, look, you, you want to supersize yourself? And I said, yeah, you want to supersize the entire population of this planet? Then you have to go into the Amazon and you have to cut all the trees down. Why? Because if you want to raise all those, those cows, <laughs> uh, well, you have to feed them and uh, they don't eat the trees, they eat the grass. So you cut all the trees down and then you feed the cows. Uh, and so you lose the respiration system of the planet. Plus, the cows and their methane is, is uh, I was jokingly, if I could say it, is are farting us out of existence. <laughs> <laughs> right, because, by our request, because we want the 99 cent burger. Uh, absolutely. As a society, so, uh, and then and monocropping <laughs> is a disaster to ecology. Monocropping is where you say, look, we're going to plant palm trees for palm oil. Mm -hmm. I said, how do you do it? We, we get rid of everything, flatten the entire land and just plant one kind of plant. Mm -hmm. It's like, this is an ecological disaster. Why? Because all the organisms that live, the, the, the insects, the worms, the things mm -hmm. in the ground, the bees, the bugs, everything mm -hmm. above the ground, the animals, all of this, the diversity of our biology is because we have the diversity of a, of a landscape. Mm -hmm. When you take that diversity away and put in a monocrop into our, our um, world, that monocrop uh, gets rid of the diversity, and as a result, uh, we lose the, the diversity and variety of the organisms on this planet, which are keeping us alive. Okay. Are, are we losing like a thousand species a day right now? Is that well, I, I, I just know that the, the, that the normal loss is uh, your background, and I said that from from the uh, the science right now, it's a thousand times greater than background. So I can't tell you, but what it is is it's a number that I don't even want to think about because right. it's a kind of very destructive of our own of our own worldview mm -hmm. and our own way of life on this planet. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, what's really important for us right now? is to uh, recognize, look, you can't do this anymore. Yeah, so solutions. So we need to look at changing our behaviors. Food choice is one that I focus on a lot with my work because I recognize it as being one easy, attainable, free solution for everyone that can solve all these problems, right? The ocean acidification, the yeah. overfishing, the rainforest destruction, the, I mean, all I, of it, I, right? I would like to offer an insight to that. Please. Okay, the insight to that is our food consumption is a consequence of habit, not a consequence of need. Yes. We eat because they say, well, start off with breakfast, that's your best meal of the day, and then lunchtime we're going to eat some lunch, and then dinner time we're going to have some dinner, and we become habituated to eating three times a day. Are you hungry? Not necessarily, but it's lunchtime, so we're going to go eat. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, what's the consequence of this? And I say, we are eating food beyond anything necessary for an individual survival. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, how much food does a human require? And this is the exciting information. Virtually very little, <laughs> virtually almost nothing. You say, what do you mean? I say, during the developmental years when you're building a system, okay, uh, nourishment is, is critical for the development of the child. But as we get to our adult stage, that degree of nourishment is, is actually uh, dangerous to our survival. You go, wait a minute, we're, we're, our, the nourishment is, is actually creating our problem. I go, absolutely. Uh, and I'll give you a reason right now. When you burn fuel, uh, you get energy, but you also get byproducts of that fuel burning, many of which are toxic. So like you can burn gasoline in a car, but don't breathe the exhaust that comes out. That'll kill you, okay? Mm -hmm. I say burning food is another process of burning, burning uh, you know, something to get energy out of it. And I say, well, wh what is the consequence of, of your metabolism? I say, uh, the more food that we eat, the more byproducts called free radicals, which are the equivalent of carbon monoxide coming out of a car. Mm -hmm. The free radicals are a byproduct of metabolism. I say, what about them? I say, they destroy cells. Free radicals bind to cells and destroy cells. I go, wait a minute. The more I eat, the more free radicals I put in the system. Yes. Regardless of what you eat? Yeah. Free ra if you're going to digest food, you're going to metabolize and you're gonna break down things into sugar and all that, the breaking down of those products inevitably has to, you can't have like zero emissions from, from a combustion product, okay? And so uh, free radicals are apparently one of the primary reasons uh, for a shortening of the human lifespan. 
uh, as I understand it from conventional science, a human's life should be normally about 140 years. Wow. Uh, and that would be our life. And we, what, 90 is a big time thing there, you right. know? And I'm going, well, what about those other 50 years? And it's like, the, the way we are polluting our bodies is really removing 50 years off of our life. And, and I say, well, what about all this food? Don't we all need this food? And I go, interesting point. There are people called breatharians. Right. Okay, and I say, well, what, they, well you know, a lot too. of them say they don't eat anything. And then people say, yeah, but they, they probably sneak something in. I go, okay, let's accept that for a minute. I sneak some food into my diet, and that's all I needed? What the heck was supersize me all about? <laughs> all I needed was a minimal amount uh, of nutrition because my body can trap energy from the environment. Like plants will trap, plants trap energy from the sunlight. Mm -hmm. Animals can trap energy from the magnetic and electromagnetic fields of the earth, okay? And, but if you don't believe in that, then your belief system is I have to eat. And then you say, well, I have to eat, then I have to eat this much food. And then I eat, and then it's like, oh, I want more food. And the next thing, no, you're eating a quantity of food in excess of anything that any normal human would need. Mm -hmm. and, and then the compensation is, well, now we're eating so much and we're re reproducing at such a rate that then the amount of food needed for all the offspring is then greater and greater. So it's like a, a, a snowball rolling down a hill. Mm -hmm. It's ultimately creating an avalanche that we're gonna be at the bottom of this pile soon. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, well, you mean you, you really uh, don't need to eat that much? Well, how about all those people in Africa that are starving? I go, well, this is the issue. It's a habituation to the belief that you need food. Mm -hmm. So in the absence of food, the belief would say, wait, I need food to live. I don't have food. I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a feedback system. Right. And I say, if the breatharians can get by on this small amount of food, then nobody should be really starving even if they have a minimal amount of food because if the breatharian can do it in the middle of uh, at Los Angeles with all that's going on and still survive and enjoy life and be healthy without left food, then what about everybody else around them that is you know, eating these massive quantities of food? How come uh, these Africans are dying so quickly? And I say, it's a habituation to the belief of the need of food. And if I believe I need food and I can't get food, then my belief will also then say, well, if I can't get food, then, uh, then my life is now on the line. Mm -hmm. And so and I say, well, can I just say today, Bruce says right here, I don't need food, so now I'm gonna stop. I say, no, you can't do that either because you've habituated the system Right, to all of that. your cells believe that you need it. Right, so yeah. therefore, to, to go to the breatharian state is a period of adjustment. Mm -hmm that will take a long period to wean yourself off the massive diet mm -hmm. and get down and then find that you can be just as healthy and have just as much energy uh, without all that food that we were doing. So I said, yeah, that would be a real direction for this planet to learn that. But as I said, uh, you just can't say, oh, I don't need to eat food, so today I'm not eating food. It's like that will have a disaster in, in your biology. So it's a learning experience and a weaning off and a, it, it's a making a new habit, really. Mm -hmm. You can't just say, I'm not gonna have the habit today. It's like, no, it's a habit. You got it, you have to change it. I'd like to get more into that, into the biology of belief, the title of your first book. Um, and your, uh, your other book following that, right? Spontaneous Evolution. Yeah, I love that one. Right, so I was at your lecture yesterday where we, you were talking a lot about the subconscious and the, um, going deeply into the science of the biology of belief and um, the invisible forces that influence your life and um, the idea that um, uh, so, many, so many points I picked out from your lecture. What, and I think anyone can read your book and, and learn the science. We don't need to go too deep into why not it is the way it is. Not the mechanical part. Not the mechanical part. But one burning question for me is, if, if we're run by the subconscious, which is what, like 95%, right? 95% of our life is driven by automated, habitual programs that are downloaded into the subconscious. Mm -hmm. And that belief is what basically um, makes our creates our experience right absolutely absolutely so, so then how do we shift to the subconscious what's what's the trick to that i mean well, the shift out of the subconscious mm -hmm. okay let, let's first put it this way let, let's define something so we get this straight okay uh the 
the work uh, of the, the biology that I provide in the biology belief reveals that um, the environment of the cells is controlling the genetics and behavior. I say, what is the environment of the cells? Well, in my research, I would put cells in a plastic petri dish and put culture medium, and then the culture medium was what the cells live in. Cells are, cells are like fish, they have to live in a fluid environment. So I make like an aquarium in my culture dish, and I say, what's the, the aquarium made of? I say, well, it's called culture medium. I say, what's that? I say, a laboratory version of blood. Mm -hmm. So if I'm gonna grow human cells, I look at the composition of human blood and then create a synthetic version, and I call that culture medium. I call it human culture medium, okay? If I grow mouse cells, I, I look at the composition of mouse blood and then make a synthetic version, and that's a culture medium for mouse cells, okay? Mm -hmm. So what the research revealed very just simply was genetically identical cells in different petri dishes, but I changed the chemical composition of the environment, mm -hmm. the equivalent of blood. Okay. Changed the chemistry a little bit. That with genetically identical cells in three dishes, in one dish I can get muscle cells to form in one culture medium, and I get bone cells to form in a different version of culture medium, and in a third version of culture medium, I get fat cells, but the whole idea was what? They were all genetically identical cells that were just split into three dishes. Mm -hmm. So the first question is, well, did genes control the expression of the cell? And the answer is, absolutely not. Why? They all had the same genes. Mm -hmm. I said, what well, was the only difference? I said, the composition of the environment. Mm -hmm. Okay? So then I say, okay, Bruce, it's a really nice experiment. Uh, cells in a Petri dish, synthetic version of blood. Uh, what does it have to do with me? And I go, well, the cool part is this. When you look in the mirror and see yourself as a single individual, it's a misperception. A misperception, you're not a single entity. You're made out of 50 trillion cells. The cells are the living entity. When I say the word Bruce, that's a name for a community. Uh, that's not a name for a single <laughs> cell in my body. It's a name for 50 trillion cells collectively creating my body. So Bruce is the name of the community, like the United States, yeah. uh, France, Bruce. You know, yeah. it's one of those. <laughs> I and I say, that. well, okay, so then the, the, the humorous aspect of it is then a human body is a skin-covered Petri dish. Mm. Underneath the skin is 50 trillion cells that are living in harmony and community. But like the cells, and in fact, uh, where the culture medium came from is that the cells in our body live in culture medium, but that's the original blood. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it doesn't make a difference if the cell's in the plastic dish or in the skin-covered dish. The fate of the cell is determined by the composition of the culture medium. Right, and it's, I, I get that, and it's great for people to understand this. And isn't it true that we all have these, like, maybe cancer cells and other diseases in us, and it's some, for some of us they express and for some of us they don't because it's dependent on the environment? Right, but the idea is that we have the diseases built into us. Less mm -hmm. than 1% of the population can legitimately claim that I have a disease because of my genetic background. Mm -hmm. okay? Scientifically, Less yes. than 1% of diseases can be attributed to genetics. Mm -hmm. Well, that immediately opens up the big question. Jesus, if only 1% of disease is coming from the genetics, where the heck is the other 90 plus percent of disease coming from? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, the environment in which the cells are living. I say, yeah, but what's that? I say, the blood. So I say, oh, the blood is causing disease. And I say, no, the composition of the blood. Mm -hmm. I go, oh, well then I say, so in one composition of blood, like I said, in one composition, my cells can form muscle. In one composition, my cells can form bone. Mm -hmm. Or in one composition, my cells express cancer. And another composition, they don't. So it wasn't the genes that caused cancer. And that's a really important part because how many people are so uh, uh, you know, mentally uh, afraid mm -hmm. because in their family there's diseases like a cancer or Alzheimer's or cardiovascular disease or diabetes is running in the family. And they say, oh my God, it's in my family lineage. My grandmother, my grandfather, my uncle, my father, my mother, whatever. I go through the whole lineage. I, they all got this disease. And, and we have the belief and have held that belief for years. Oh, the transmission of a disease is the transmission of genetics. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the answer to that is, well, that's totally false. 
<laughs> the transmission is not in the genetics. That's great news, and even better news is you have control over it, right? That's the it because what I said. It's all in your head. That's it right? because basically I said, so what's the disease too? If it's not the genetics, I say the chemical composition of the blood, and then I say, well, then who or what is controlling the chemical composition? I go, the brain is the chemist, yeah. and then the last and most important connecting part is if the brain is releasing chemistry in the blood, then what? kind of chemistry should the should be released and then I go ah the top rung of the ladder what is the picture in your mind mm -hmm. and I say what does that mean I say whatever you're visualizing in your mind that picture is translated by the brain into chemistry mm -hmm. okay and so the chemistry released by the brain is a complement to the picture you can have a picture of total health and vitality I go, oh, well, in that case, then the chemistry that's coming from that brain is going to induce health and vitality. But you could have fear or even just the fear of having a cancer. And I say, oh, well, that's a, a very negative visual image. And I go, yeah, and the chemistry that will come out of the brain will be complementary to that. It'll be negative chemistry to do what? Manifest the picture in, in your brain. And I go, Oh, so the picture I hold of my life in my consciousness, or my, it's actually my subconsciousness, uh, is, is translated by the nervous system into chemistry, which then uh, creates a complementary structure in my body to the picture in my brain. Mm -hmm. And I go, yes, it's called creativity. We are creating our lives, and mm -hmm. we're creating it by the programs and the beliefs because those programs and belief are, are then translated into the chemistry, which now we know controls the genetics, and that's the new science called epigenetics, mm -hmm. uh, where the environment is controlling the genetics and, f and, and fate of the cells. So environment is the key issue. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, in our conversation, a point about that is, well, what about my nutritional environment? I go, yeah, that is a key issue. Uh, of what uh, is going to be translated by the brain into the behavior. Uh, but but the, the most important issue is what do we believe? Because here's the point. Epigenetics means, well, simplify it because people need to know this because this is the, the revolution in science. Yeah, uh, bring it. Genetics is the belief that everybody's been programmed with, conventional belief. And that belief has some belief connected to it, such as genes turn on and off and regulate our biology, and then turned out, then genes were not just our physical biology, but then connected to our behavior. And then genes were connected to our emotions. And I go, then the conventional thought in the public is, the genes that we get at the conception moment when sperm and egg come together, are sort of pre-programming our life because they're gonna give us the details of our physicality, our behavior, and our emotions. And, and then I go, well, this is a problem for people because A, as far as we know, we didn't pick the genes. B, if we end up with those so-called troublemaking genes, uh, we have no control over the genes according to the system. The genes control us. So I say, oh my God, the conventional story, you become a victim of your heredity. Mm -hmm. What's running in my family is I have no control over it. The cancer's running in my family. Oh my God, I'm gonna have cancer because the belief is genes are turning on and off and regulating our biology. Well, that's completely false. <laughs> it's completely false for the fact is genes have no control over anything. Genes do not have an on and off. Genes do not make decisions. Genes don't carry cancer in them. Genes are just uh, blueprints to make the functions of the body. Uh, and so it says, well, wait a minute. Since we've all been programmed that genes turn on and off and make the control, then what is it that elicits the activity of genes? And I go, ah, that's the new science called epigenetics. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds almost the same, but I say, oh my God, you couldn't get anything different as genetics and epigenetics. And I mm -hmm. say, why, what's different? I say, genetics, Genes control your life, genetic control, control by genes. That makes you a victim. Because if you didn't pick the genes and you can't change the genes, then by definition, you are an expression of the genes. Mm -hmm. The new science, epigenetics, I say, ah, epi means above, the prefix epi. Mm -hmm. So if I say epigenetic control, I am saying control above the genes. I go, so the genes are not in control. I said, well, what is above the genes that is controlling genes? I said, exactly what I saw in the Petri dish. The environment is controlling the expression of genes. So 
in our conventional biomedical model, they immediately, you know, once they started to get into epigenetics, which was officially, you know, uh, named as a science in like 1990, uh, it says, oh my God, the environment is, is controlling our genes. And then immediately we look at, oh, well, what environment are you in and how can you change that environment? Or our food is our environment. Uh, how, you know, oh, these are very important because this is the environment controlling who we are. Uh, you know, I'll give a simple example. You walk outside and it's cold out. Mm -hmm. the, the nervous system picks up the temperature and says, oh, cold, uh, and then adjusts your, your metabolism to warm you up and mm -hmm. keep you at the right temperature. And I say, well, who controlled your metabolism? The environment. <laughs> it was the cold that caused it to mm -hmm. change. Okay, I said, well, if you walk outside and it's hot out, oh, that's a different environmental signal, and that will cause uh, my metabolism to change and then result in cooling me off. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I go, cool. So everyone just talks about the environment. I go, and now you've missed the biggest point. Yes, there's an environment outside, and yes, the nervous system picks up the information of that environment, and without our mind involved, would just translate the environment into biology by controlling our genetics so our biology would match the environment, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, now, we also have to add that, but humans are a bit different than all the smaller animals, and that is what? Between the environment and the genes is the mind. Mm -hmm. I say, well, what's the relevance? I said, well, you look at the world, and your mind is doing an interpretation. Yep. It's not, it's looking at the world, reading the data, but then interpreting the data. And I say, well, why is that relevant? Well, two people in the exact same spot, in the exact same environment, look at the same environment, but it's based on their beliefs, which is the mind and mm -hmm. their perceptions. Conditioning, And right? the conditioning. Yeah. So one person looks at the environment and go, oh, wow, this is wonderful, healthy, I'm very happy in this environment. And the other one looks at the same thing, but based on their conditioning says, oh my God, this is a threatening environment. And I say, well, what's the result? Well, the chemistry in the blood of person A is chemistry that enhances health. Mm -hmm. But the one that perceives it as a scary negative environment, the chemistry released by that brain can actually uh, interfere with health and can cause all the diseases. That's where about 90% or more of the disease comes from. Not from the real environment, but from our interpretation of the environment. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, that, well, your interpretation is your belief. Yeah. I believe this is a negative environment, and therefore my nervous system is going to create chemistry to control my biology as if, as if I'm in a threatening world. Right. So it's as simple as what you think is what you get. Is that you know, that, 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 that's uh, okay. You took all my years of research <laughs> and you put it in five I seconds. Thank book. you very much. Yeah, it's a very short book. Page one. <laughs> what you see is what you get. <laughs> End of story. But it's accurate, right? It is totally accurate. And that's the fun part, you know, because we have such a, a, a human quality of making things very complex. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, nature is not complex, nature is ultimately very simple. And yet, when we put our complexity in a way, that's our interpretation. Mm -hmm. And that complexity then can screw up everything. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, as you said, it could be just as simple as that. Is what you see is what you get, but what you see is there's a pair of filters, you're wearing glasses, right. and, and so what's out there is going through these glasses mm -hmm. and being filtered. Yeah by what your belief is. So only mm -hmm. certain information is coming in, not all the information, and it can be totally distorted. You got some bad glasses that your world is fuzzy. Right. <laughs> it's like, yeah, but you distorted the image. Right. So epigenetics and genetics, let's, let's put the, the five second conclusion. The, the, the conclusion is simply this, the old belief of genetics, we are victims because genes control us and we didn't pick the genes. The new science of epigenetics says we are masters because it says that the, uh, the genetic expression is connected to the environment and more specifically to our perception of the environment. I say, well, I can change my environment and surely I can change my perception. So all of a sudden it's like, well then, I'm the one that can regulate the genes. I go, absolutely. So uh, old belief, which almost everybody's been programmed with, is I'm a victim of my heredity mm -hmm. and new belief is I am a master of my genetic expression and the health and, and the vitality of my mm -hmm. life because I can change my thoughts and I can change my environment and therefore I'm not, a, I'm not limited. 
But uh, can we change our subconscious thoughts? Because if we're 95% run by the subconscious, ment- consciously, sure, I can just, I, I totally, this is clicking with me deeply right now. Yeah. So I can go, I can see where I'm doing that and where I can change my thoughts and do my practice consciously. Yeah. But how do we control this 95% of us that is subconscious? How do we switch that? Okay. Uh, let, let's uh, let's uh, give a little definition of that to, to if the listener's not very clear. The, the mind has two parts, uh, conscious and subconscious. Mm-hmm. The, the, the profound difference between the two is the subconscious is the habit mind. You learn something, and once you learn it, you never have to relearn it again. A lot of people attribute all the hell on earth to the subconscious. Well, let's don't blame the subconscious. It's just a record playback device. Uh, what you want to blame it on, if anything, is what the hell did you record? <laughs> and I say, well, this is be- the critical part because the primary programming of the subconscious mind occurs before age seven. <clears throat> and the reason for that, excuse me, the reason for that is simply this, is that conscious is creativity. But if you don't have any foundation to create from, you have a blank slate. And all of a sudden I have consciousness. Is I'm conscious of what? There's nothing to be conscious of. There's nothing in my, my program. I have no program. So the first seven years, it's actually the last trimester of pregnancy in the first seven years, hmm. uh, the human brain is uh, functioning at a lower vibrational level than consciousness. Uh, and I'm talking vibrational level, it's not new age woo-woo. I'm talking the fact that you can put wires on your head and through electroencephalograph, EEG, you can read the vibrational activity of the brain, which is an electrical mechanical device, and you can read the vibration with these wires attached to your head. And I'm saying, yes, and there are levels of vibration that are associated with different aspects of our life. So the lowest vibration is delta. When you're at sleep at night and you're really not using your brain, it's, it's like humming along idling mm-hmm. at delta, very low vibration. And then as you start to you know, wake up in a sense, the vibration level picks up to a higher level called theta. And that's the vibration uh, uh, just before consciousness kicks in. And then as you wake up, as you actually wake up, your vibration level jumps to the next higher vibration called alpha, Mm -hmm. which is called calm consciousness. So hopefully when you wake up in the morning, there's a calm, I'm here, I'm awake, here I am, you know, this is my life, whatever, I'm calm. And then when you go to work or go to school or do the active uh, processing of the brain, that's a higher vibration called beta, Mm -hmm. okay? So what does it mean is that there are different levels of vibration and that consciousness begins at the alpha and beta level, that's where consciousness is. Below that is theta, which we're awake but not fully conscious in a sense of consciousness meaning we have control. Mm-hmm. Theta is subconscious is uh, engaged now. It wakes up before consciousness. Okay, and the subconsciousness, uh, the subconscious theta, in the first seven years, that's our predominant EEG activity, mm-hmm. uh, is associated with imagination. And I say, yeah, a child for the first seven years, operating primarily in theta, has the ability to mix uh, imagination and real world events. So uh, a child riding a broom says, oh, I'm on a horse. In the mind of that child, that's not a broom. In the mind, that, that's the horse that they imagine, mm-hmm. okay? Mm-hmm. So the mother says, give me the broom, and the child is like, what? <laughs> it's like, this is a horse. <laughs> Why? Because you mix imagination and reality. And I say, oh well, yeah, this is the first seven years of a child's life. And I also then bring in now the most important part. This is also called hypnosis. Mm. So the first seven years of a child's life, it's subconscious is like a video recorder. The button is on, it's recording. What? The behavior of the mother, the behavior of the father, the behavior of siblings in the community. I go, wow, why would it do that? And the answer is this. This child has to integrate itself into the community called a family and then into the larger community outside of the family. And integrating, it means that you have to understand the rules. You can't create your own rules and then, you know, uh, and, and then be part of the community. There's collective rules. I said, well, how does a child, one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old, learn the thousands of rules, if you had to write them down, of being a functional member of a family and a community? I mean, just to give a, a variety thing here, how a father talks to a child, it's how a father talks to their own child 
is different than how a father would talk to somebody else's child, which is different than how the father would talk to an adult, which is different than how the father will talk to the mother, which is different than how the father would talk to the policeman. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you start, wow, well, every one of those is a unique behavior. And I go, yeah, how does a child know not to act, uh, let's say, uh, when a policeman's around uh, and talk to the policeman like a baby? It's like, no, you got to talk different. I say, how, how do you teach a child that? Give it a book? And I say, the child can't read the book. I say, nature took care of that. Nature said, Oh, we'll just program the child, put the recorder on, the child will see how the parents behave in all their situations mm -hmm. and download that as their behavior. So this is a very critical point for the rest of our discussion. Mm -hmm. The foundational programs of behavior of how we treat ourselves and how we treat the rest of the world, the programs in the subconscious are not from our consciousness, they're downloaded by other people. Make sure you tune into the next episode to hear part two of my interview with Dr. Bruce Lipton. Thanks so much for answering the call to be here today. I'm so glad you're part of our tribe of activated rainbow warriors. If you found the show in any way empowering or inspiring, I would be so grateful if you would share the show on social media or with friends and family that you think would benefit from these conversations. And also, rate and review the show in iTunes. This is really the very best way to help support the show and help us get noticed by others who are looking for the sort of content that we're sharing. Now notice there are no outside ads playing here. That's because the show is supported by you, the listener. You can become a patron of the show with a small monthly donation by checking out the perks on our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash visionary lifestyle and signing up there. There's also a one-time donation button on the podcast page of the website if that suits you better. And just so you know, your donations help to cover the necessary out-of-pocket monthly expenses to produce the show and will also help us grow so we can inspire and educate even more people. And hey tribe, I'd love to hear from you. Visit me at visionary-lifestyle.com and please tell me your comments and questions. I really look forward to connecting with you. I love you. Namaste.